episode. Okay. We should be live here. So for today, um, um, Ben Bowman is our guest facilitator. And after he introduces uh, his work, we're going to have an open discussion. So we always want to hear as many voices as possible and just ask you to please introduce yourself in a sentence or two if you do have a question or comment. Um, maybe say something about what you work on or how you're involved in climate education or research. Uh, research. And you know, feel free to either raise your hand using the little icon or unmute yourself or post something in the chat. We're pretty informal. So with that, I am very excited to introduce Ben Bowman, who's a lecturer in youth justice at Manchester Metropolitan University. He has a really broad background in the politics of youth and young people's activism. And Ben works with the Manchester Center for Youth, uh, youth Studies, where he's been researching and writing pretty extensively on youth climate activism for many years. I think one of the, the links that I included in the email invitation, just that one alone was to many of the articles that he's posted in the conversation. And I was looking through it last night, there were like well over a dozen just on youth, the youth struggle for climate justice. Um, and as I was reading through some of these, you know, I was feeling my own perspective start to shift in terms of the way that I think about kids and, the, and their place in this movement. So I know that we're all really excited to learn more about how to support young people with the tools for change. And as Ben wrote in his little blurb, you know, it's young people who are calling for systems change, not climate change. So Ben, I'm gonna let you take it from, uh, from there. And maybe you could say um, something also about the link that, and I can drop that again down at the bottom so people can find it. Um, ben has provided his slides. I'm gonna put this in the chat. Um, if you do want to follow along on your own end uh, or save them for later or change the font size or go at your own pace, you'll have the option to do that. So with that, it's all yours, Ben. Sure, thank you very much. Uh, hello, everybody, wherever you are. For me, uh, you can imagine me um, uh, right at the bottom of, uh, of the Moors. The Peak District is just over here and the city of Manchester is over there uh, in the UK. And for me, uh, this is the beginning of my holiday. So, um, and I'm utterly wiped out from a very hard term. <laughs> so, um, so I'm going to uh, probably simplify a lot of things, which I hope we can discuss later. Uh, I'm going to aim for about an hour for this session, including the discussion. So I'm not gonna give you like a long lecture. Uh, the other thing is that I've, I've included some things on these slides, which, um, which we may go over simply. Uh, if in doubt, I've added more text to this slide. So, um, so the slides will stay online in case they're ever useful to you. In any case, this is me. If you want to write to me, those are two ways you can. I love hearing from people, so you'd be very welcome to. Uh, now, how do I change this slide here? Ah, there we go. So um, the title for this session, uh, I borrow from a quote uh, from a climate striker, uh, Brianna Freen, who's from Samoa. And she writes, uh, real education sometimes happens outside of the classroom. Uh, I think the school climate strikes have really proven, proven that. Um, and I, I kind of want us to reflect on that specifically for our toolkit. So what kind of things can we learn from young people? What, what are young people doing that we can learn from? Uh, one thing that I'm not gonna do here is to like do an adult thing and interpret what young people are doing. I, I think it's, what I want to do is talk about what what we can learn and, and what we can see, um, because I think young people speak for themselves uh, apart from anything else. And then I want to kind of look at this, this term real education and, and ways that we can learn from the ways that young people use their action uh, and, and the ways that we can look at our own work as educators um, uh, and working with young people in it. This is the a link, I know it's a really ugly URL, um, but it's, uh, it's a link to an interview um, with, um, with Brianna Freen and Anna Taylor uh, by Hazel Healy. Can I just point out, although it's not really discussed in this um, uh, discussion, in this presentation, uh, these are three women and this is really, uh, you cannot discuss the young climate movement without saying this is not abnormal. It's often uh, women, it's, a, it's really a women-led movement. Um, that probably a discussion for another time, but an important one to raise. So what are, anyway, here we go. Uh, we're gonna start with an activity. 
because I love to do things and also because my brain is mashed potato at this point of the year um, and I want you to do some work. So please get a piece of paper and a pen or you can write on your computer if you want to open up notepad or something like that. It's not a complicated activity. What I'd like you to do for this first task is think of something in your city or town, your place uh, that could be improved. And uh, you're not gonna be tested on it or even, I'm not gonna require you to report it. So it could be anything. Could be traffic, could be roads, could be the park, could be local provision of services, could be anything. Something in your place that could be improved. And write it down, yeah, write it down. You can continue to think. The second half of this task is what action you take to get it done. So think of this issue, think of this improvement that you'd like to see, or think of this problem that you'd like to get fixed. Can you think of one mode of action you could take? What's something that you could take to get it done? Could just be a couple of words, yeah. I'm not gonna stop you writing, but I'm gonna keep talking. Um, when you're finished, keep your task safe because we'll come back to it, okay? Now, one thing uh, that we see all around the world, certainly since 2018, although there's a long history of school strikes. Uh, I mean, here in the UK, we had school strikes in the uh, 19th century, uh, right through um, the uh, uh, 1900s, right through the 20th century, right through 1980s, 1970s, 80s, 90s, all the way to today. And we've seen school strikes around the world from Soweto to the civil rights movement in the US. Uh, school strikes are a very familiar way for young people to take political action. One of the reasons that they are, uh, and I, you know, I'm not really defining terms here, but just kind of giving you a, a depiction of it as not something that was invented in 2018. Uh, school produces workers, it produces voters and it produces citizens. And so children's a school strike is, a chil is children's withdrawal of labor from those systems. It's children withdrawing their labor in, the, in very much the same way that I would when I go on strike from the economic system and also from the political and democratic systems because these are young people saying, okay, the education system is what turns me into a citizen. It, it socializes me to, me to a democracy and I'm not gonna do it. I'm withdrawing my labor from it. And it is also sometimes uh, a withdrawal of labor from family life too. Uh, this poster is um, being held up by a climate striker in Manchester who was part of one of my studies. Um, and in the interview with her, um, uh, I was very grateful for that interview. Um, they were talking about um, how their uh, parents didn't allow them to come. And this this poster was done after dark when everybody else had gone to bed. And because it was it was banned, it was a banned poster, and um, they're on strike anyway. And then it's important to say not only is it the withdrawal of labor, but also the disruption of these systems. So apart from anything else, these strikers on this day disrupted a main city square. Now, if you look back on your first task, you may have written that you take strike action, but I, um, I'd like you to reflect a little bit on the method that you thought of. Um, and although I would love the time to kind of hear from everybody, and if we were in class, we'd have a discussion over it. Maybe one of your, maybe your method was one of these. You might have thought, well, if there was a problem in my town, I'd write to my local representative or my MP or, you know, something like that. A lot of people would say, well, I'd start off with a petition or I'd see how much interest I could gather, I guess, signatures and then send it to a decision maker. Uh, and some people would say, well, you know, you've got to build a, build up with people and, and gather people together for a protest. Not for everybody, but a lot of methods that people will come up with when put on the spot will be quite familiar, conventional or, or maybe unconventional political methods like this. These methods, and I know I'm generalizing, but I think it's the case, these methods tend to marginalize young people. So there are legal or informal restrictions on access. Um, and, and even if you just look at like, informal and in, informal and formal restrictions, they're intersectional restrictions. So one thing that I would give you an example for is I used to work with a local council uh, here in the UK. And one thing that they said to me was they wanted me to help them uh, uh, talk to young people 
And they considered that there were no, um, that there was no cost of entry to come and talk to the council. And they were an independent council. They had open meetings, the public could come, but the meetings were at 7 p.m. They were held in a pub, so a, a, a place that served alcohol. They sat around in a circle in quite a loud room uh, and then talked for a good two hours in the evening while drinking. And these, uh, there were just so many different restrictions on access. They hadn't considered access to the building, let alone the way that people would speak there. Um, and, uh, and there's so much to say, there's so much to say about this, um, but I, I'm just gonna put it there. You know, young people find it difficult to access in many ways that intersect with all sorts of ways that the world is unequal and unfair. And one thing that really doesn't get recognized a lot with young people is how much pressure they're under and how much work they have to do. So a 7 p.m. meeting in the pub is fine if you've got the money and you've got the time to go somewhere at 7 p.m. Young people have an intensely uh, hard schedule most times. They don't have a lot of money and they don't have uh, the kind of hours flexibility that, that people who, who, who have jobs do. Now, I'm not saying young people are alone in that, but it is something that marks young people out. Um, they work very high stress jobs in education. Uh, being in school is very high stressed. As well as these, you know, methods like writing to an MP will marginalize young people because, apart from anything else, the language you've got to use, because uh, the MPs will push you out, they won't uh, respect you. But also, on the other hand, just as uh, I think, as, as kind of traditional politics marginalizes young people. So this kind of personal, uh, uh, that personal realm can be more effective for young people and kind of pull people, to, young people towards it. And one person who writes about this uh, um, is Sarah Pickard, talks about young people doing it ourselves, you know, uh, going out to take action for themselves or, or looking for something where they can see that their action will be directly effective rather than trying to put their trust into an adult. Um, and I, one thing that I, I kind of want to leave you with here with this very detailed discussion, which we can't give enough time to if we had two hours, um, is that young people tend to be quite pragmatic in their action. They want to see some results. They want to see that they're respected uh, and that there's some utility in the effort that they're putting in. Um, they also tend to be quite subversive in my experience. So, um, so they'll find uh, opportunities, for instance, to work alongside a teacher in order to get the rubber stamp from the teacher and then do what they were planning to do anyway. Um, they, can, they can utilize uh, adult power in ways that can be subversive. Um, and also they, they tend to kind of mix and mash. Uh, they tend to be more malleable than adults. So they, they'll fit what they're doing around other things. So, in this massive world that we would call the study of young people's politics, I would say uh, there are a couple of things we need to, to kind of isolate for our toolkit. One is not young people are pushed out from adult politics. They're pushed out by adults individually and they're pushed out systemically. It's a systemically exclusionary uh, politics. And they're pushed out of adult hierarchies. Um, not only are they pushed out by adult politics, also less formal, more everyday, more personal stuff is often uh, more effective. And in the last session, a couple of weeks ago, um, I talked about a, a kind of um, in a comment about a, an activist group by young people in Los Angeles um, where the demonstrators, and they were successful, which is great, um, uh, brought, um, brought a case to the school board of governors asking for the police to be demilitarized in the school system. So they wanted the weaponry taken off the police. And one thing that they did, uh, which I thought was um, really well written by An Annalisa Mejia Macinas, who published an article on it, um, uh, was that they kind of brought in emotion very effectively. So they made that case to the board of governors but they also used uh, emotional tactics. They used singing, they used music, they used signs of, with a big picture of a gun and said, how would you feel? You know, these kind of uh, complicated, um, uh, really kind of um, adept uh, uh, remixing of different methods and, and the use of the personal uh, can be very effective for young people. So as a kind of a grand, um, uh, grand plan here, uh, I would say for our toolkit, and I would put it to you, that young politics is often kind of this little p, everyday politics, 
or can be a mishmash of, of the political and the personal. And that it's really important, I think, that we see it not as disengagement when young people use these tools. So if they're using emotion or they're using music or something like that, that we don't see that as a disengagement from adult politics, um, uh, nor do we see it as something needing a fix. So if young people are doing something that's not writing to their own P, that's not the place for an adult to say, but have you considered engaging with adult politics? Because it's not just that young people don't engage, it's that they're pushed out. And it's not just that young people don't engage with those kind of formal political institutions because they're apathetic or whatever. It's also because other modes are far more effective for them often. Anyway, so, I mean, this is, that was the most technical part of my presentation. I have a second task for you, um, uh, accompanied by my drawings here, which is my uh, very uh, neat attempt to get around um, uh, creative uh, um, copyright legislation. I can always put my pictures online when I draw them. Here comes your second task, okay? What I'd like you to do is for a second, um, thank you, <laughs> um, is to put yourself in the shoes of a young climate striker, okay? So put yourself in those shoes. Uh, think of yourself as a young climate striker for a moment. And what I'd like you to do, even in just a couple of seconds, is plan, uh, plan out what your protest sign would be. So I would like you to come up maybe with a slogan. That would be enough. Uh, or if you would, if you just suddenly springs into your mind a picture um, to maybe note down what your picture would be. Uh, again, I'm going to keep talking in a minute, but I'll, I'll let you keep working on it if you like. Um, even just a couple of words for a slogan will help you out. Um, so yeah, plan or sketch your protest sign. I'm very glad to bring these activities to you because I planned them out. I was invited to give a class on um, the climate strikes to a, a course in human geography and, um, and it was canceled because of coronavirus. So I had this whole like list of different tasks. We were gonna do all these workshops on it and then um, yeah, it all got cold, cold off. So, so you're my guinea pigs now. You can keep working, I'm gonna talk. I can't even see whether you're paying attention. Um, <laughs> Here we go. Um, so, um, so we've talked a little bit about young people's politics uh, in, in kind of conceptual terms. Um, more specifically, talking about the climate strikes, uh, what do we see young people doing? Um, now, it's a global movement and there are an awful lot of young people involved in it. And so um, I would shy away from generalizing too much. However, there are a couple of things that I think personally um, kind of stand out about it. Um, one of them, and I can give you an example of it, uh, comes from the Student Guide to the Climate Crisis, which was written by two students as part of a, a group um, here in Manchester. Uh, Pooja Kishinani and Marion Smith are the named authors, and you can get it online. Um, one thing that I, I, I really stands out to me, uh, as far as my opinion's worth anything, is that, um, is that this is a guide that's really remarkably young in its, in, its, in its kind of output. It looks really like young activism to me in the way that it mixes and remixes different methods. And in particular, um, for, for our toolkit, I think, which talks a lot about grief, um, it mixes joy with grief and it mixes happiness with grief in a way that I think you see at a climate strike. Uh, one of the people that I've worked with um, on climate activism is Sarah Picard, who's at the Sorbonne Nouvelle in Paris. And she and I, uh, in discussions, she shared with me that um, in all her work on protests over the decades, the climate strikes feel like the most joyful and welcoming and the most cheerful that she's ever been to. Uh, the climate strikes tend to be really joyful places as well as um, uh, struck with grief and loss. And, um, and it's that kind of complexity of emotion that I see coming out in young, in young climate activism. Um, I think what's always interesting to me about, uh, our, about work like this is the way that, in my opinion again, uh, you see uh, the work in kind of a, as a pastiche or a collage. So you see lots of different things coming in. 
And there's a, in particular, and I think it's characteristic of the young climate movement, that it, there's a lot of talk about care and love and support. So this, um, this document uh, really talks a lot about supporting others or working with others, um, considering other people's mental health, um, how to work with others who maybe don't uh, agree with you and how to have conversations with them. One thing that was really remarkable to me, um, again, I mean, this is like my impression and I'm sure Pooja Kishanani and Marion Smith would have their own, um, is that, um, is that it, it really is, a, it resists the limits of traditional politics. And one thing I find remarkable uh, personally about this document, um, which is about action in the climate crisis, is that it doesn't mention any politicians. Uh, except to, you know, kind of be a bit disappointed by them. So there's not a section on how to write to your MP, for instance, which is somebody who studies uh, young people's politics whenever I see a guide. That's like number one. When adults write it, the first thing they say is, how do you write to your MP? And it's not in here. Um, but what is in here is, is, is a rich collage of, of other things, like um, how to be an ally, how to care for others, uh, how to work with other students when they're going through exam stress, how, how to welcome others uh, in a discussion. Uh, there's some uh, discussion inside there about uh, attendance at Black Lives Matter movements and how to build those connections across different movements, which are, are the depth of them uh, is, is, I think, remarkable. Um, and I, and I, just kind of, I just kind of want to put it out there that this, that this young work is going on and that if um, that if you want to learn from it, I think you can just go and do it. Um, there's so much out there. There's so much out there. Now, I just kind of want to pause for a moment in this discussion of the climate crisis and tell you a story. Uh, it's not my story, it's David Graeber's story. Um, uh, and then there's a link to him telling it. Uh, he tells a story, it's a metaphorical story of an imaginary town. Where, um, where the water is monopolized by a company uh, and the mayor is in bed with the company. So there's no water except through this one company that owns the well and you can't get any political change because the mayor is, is corrupt and is in bed with the company that owns the well. And he uses this story as an analogy for describing protest. So he says, um, you've got three uh, kind of general time, types of, um, of, of action that people take. And in this case, if you've got a town where the water is monopolized, where the company a company is in charge of the well, you can protest it. So if you're going to protest, you'd probably go to the mayor's house and say, uh, we don't have any water and we need it. That's protest. Uh, Graeber's metaphor for civil disobedience is maybe you go a little bit further, you might picket the mayor's house, or you might block off access to the well. That's civil disobedience. But uh, in Graeber's metaphor, direct action is where you dig the well yourself. You go out and you do what you would do if you were free, which is you dig a well and get some water because that's what you need. So he distinguishes in this way between protest, civil disobedience and direct action. And I, this is a plot spoiler. I'm gonna tell you the climate strikes are a form of direct action, right? So if, if we kind of take this, um, this model, um, one thing that I think we can learn from with it when it comes to environmentalism, and one thing that I think can probably help our toolkit, in my opinion, is that learning from scholars like Laura Pulido, um, mainstream environmentalism, uh, and, and by that I use Pulido's term, I'm learning from Pulido, um, typically interpret uh, environmental activism as protest and not as direct action. Or as Kerner and Helferty put it in a paper called um, Contradictions of Solidarity, which I really learned a lot from and I recommend to you. Uh, they say, mainstream environmental movements have largely continued to frame the goals of the environmental movement in narrowly constructed, technocratic and dehistoricized ways. So by mainstream, uh, what I refer to uh, is, is adult, white, uh, racialized white, uh, rich, uh, north in the global sense, global north, middle class environmentalism, uh, and also scholarship, uh, sorry, uh, tends to write about the climate strikes in this kind of dehistoricized way. So uh, you'll see a lot of articles about the climate strikes, and personally I find them uh, really frustrating, that say 
Uh, the climate strikes, the message can be boiled down to a simple claim, listen to the science. Or alternatively, and at the same time, they'll say the strikes aren't giving enough conflict, concrete solutions. Um, so you see a lot, a lot of mainstream environmentalist scholarship about the young climate movement, in my opinion, that claims uh, that, that, that this movement needs to be boiled down, that it needs to be limited, and you need to identify concrete solutions of which if they are, they'll be, well, the slogan is listen to the science, um, which I think is a very limited uh, approach, or to kind of criticize them and say, well, you, they're doing all this stuff, the singing and the dancing, and it's all great, but what are you actually telling politicians to do? Where are your concrete solutions? In other words, and I, I, I would use it, and I, I would love to talk to you more about it, but, um, I would use this kind of way of looking at it, that I think currently our scholarship is really limited on the climate strikes, really limited on young environmentalism, because it's so set on trying to find narrowly constructed, technocratic and dehistoricized points to it. That's my opinion. When actually, I think if you, if you attend a strike or you listen to young people, you look at the work that they're doing and they're publishing. I mean, it's out there, you can just read it. Um, it's not narrowly constructed. And one thing uh, that I think characterizes it is that it, it tends to be a justice movement. Uh, and that goes from local strikes right through to um, things like the, um, the SMILE declaration, the Lausanne declaration of the, the climate strike movement. That, um, that this is a movement that asks for system change rather than, than and not climate change and makes difficult justice claims, right? Um, that young people are kind of navigating claiming uh, justice saying, well, we're young people, we need a better result because we're young and we deserve it, we're being left out. But also saying, uh, as some climate strikers in Manchester talked to me about, is it really right for me to say we need systems change when actually those systems benefit me because I live in a rich part of Manchester. And if I lived in Moss Side, I'd be suffering far worse air pollution. And then if I'm in Manchester, is it right that I'm claiming systems change and I'm arguing for it when people in Bangladesh may also be young, but they're affected so much deep more, um, you know, their life is affected more deeply than my own. So we've got this like uh, really rich um, and difficult uh, uh, network of solidarities uh, that young people are exploring in their work. It's not narrowly constructed. It's also not technocratic. Uh, and I, I could give you a lot of examples. Greta Thunberg herself is an example uh, who stands up and says, I shouldn't be here. How dare you applaud me, she says. Uh, and the paradox of Thunberg's uh, recognition for speaking to the UN when Kathy Yetnil Kujina, uh, the poet activist from uh, Marshall Islands, um, was there in 2014. Uh, you know, um, it doesn't, you would, I think you'd have to support young people in feeling like talking to politicians doesn't work. Um, it's also not a sustainability movement. Uh, young people don't always want to be the raw material from which uh, the world is going to be built. They want to be people, uh, nor do they always want to be the guarantors of the future because they may see this world as one whose future they don't wish to be born, right? They don't, they may not want to bear this world. They may want a different world. They may not want to sustain this one, especially if they're a justice movement that says this world is systemically unfair, uh, racist, sexist, and economically unfair. And, um, and then, you know, this dehistoricization, I think, speaks to us as educators, because so many uh, young people feel like um, what they learn is kind of the history that we don't get in school. Um, you don't hear about Kathy Yetnil Kiyina in school uh, for many young people. Um, you don't tend to hear about global justice movements. Um, to the extent that you might do, uh, having discussions at a climate strike. And, um, and this uh, uh, poster, and I, again, it's my opinion, I love this um, sign and my discussion with this climate striker. Uh, the first question I asked in the interview was, um, who, would you, who would you show it to if you could show it to anybody? Who would you show it to and what would you say? And this person said, um, fucking listen, God. <laughs> um, just this kind of feeling that um, that people aren't listening and, and it's, but, but that it's possible if we all kind of work together and everybody shares. There's such a, an interesting discussion of sharing. Uh, anyway. Finally, on this one, it's also a youth strike. 
So in all of this discussion that we have and all of this ways of thinking about it and all this intellectual work that we do, I think it's really vital that we continue to remember. It's a youth strike and they're talking to each other and organizing for each other. Uh, they're young strikes organized for young people by young people. They set out the space. Uh, the organizer of the uh, demonstration, uh, when I interviewed them, um, uh, told me that they kept all the adults to last by, um, I mean, it was obvious, uh, by design, because they wanted all the young people to speak first. The mayor came last because he's an adult. Uh, all the children came first. It's a youth strike. So what I want you to do just before we're nearly done here, and then we'll go to a discussion. I want you to take a look at your plans for the task two, right? For your plans for your sign. And what I'm going to do, and not to just kind of, I don't want to do right or wrong answers. That's not the job here. That's not the task. What I want to do is a comparison. And I, what I want to show you is a couple of strikes and a couple of kind of coding um, uh, uh, nodes um, from our study of climate protest strikes, uh, climate strike signs. Um, so here are a couple. Um, and here are uh, three, the three main codes that we got in our study. Uh, which was in the UK, so limited, um, but it was in the UK. Uh, the, main, um, the main category of signs, so the most numerous were imperatives. And we saw a lot of imperatives um, uh, of which the two most numerous subcodes were kind of act in solidarity. So referring to us or we or doing it together, or maybe um, identifying places in the world that, that, that needed to be worked with or on behalf of. So that Amazon, uh, we need to stand up for the Amazon or something like that. Uh, and also wake up. There are a lot of signs that said wake up. Stop pissing on your chips is the wake up sign because it's like you, you've got chips and you're pissing on them, stop it. You know, like we would have coded that as wake up. This is like change of behavior. Uh, we saw a lot of earth symbolism in, um, in, in pictures, in paintings, in all sorts of things, in costumes. Uh, this is one, if you did your job, we'd be in school with an unhappy earth, kind of with a broken heart. Yeah, earth symbolism. And we saw a lot of youth claims and youth centering. So in this one, we probably have coded, uh, I, if I remember correctly, we coded this poster, uh, this sign across two different codes because it's also, it's we would be in school, you know, it's identifying the young person uh, speaking to adults. And we see a lot of jokes, a lot of emotion, self-expression. We saw some rich portraiture. Uh, there was one absolutely enormous painted portrait in colors and gold um, uh, of Greta Thunberg. Uh, we saw all sorts of work, uh, poetry, song lyrics, um, uh, yeah, really a uh, rich uh, corpus. I don't know if your, your sign looks the same. Probably it does. I, I would uh, expect earth imagery, but that's me. Um, so anyway, so if there's one thing to kind of take away from that um, without just giving you like an hour's presentation, like a conference, um, if the climate strikes are anything, I think, uh, we need to learn that they're for young people and by young people. And so, um, so they're generally more than a protest. They're not just talking to adults. They're not just saying, you know, we need water. Can you please give us access to the well? They're also about imagining new worlds and they're a process of direct action. These are young people who want to see a different world, a better world and a more just world. And so they're digging that well, if you like. And I think what we see in the climate strike movement is young people coming together to dig that well, uh, to learn the history and discuss the history that they don't otherwise get, um, uh, and to imagine new worlds that they'd like to see. Do we have time? What time is it? 7.30 or 5.38. Um, do you know what? I'm going to skip this because if you've got practical questions about the movement, I'd be very happy to share them with you. If that, there's just one I'd like to give you from this slide, which is, based on this picture, one of the really rem things that really spoke to me about the demonstrations that I've seen, um, uh, both as an academic and just kind of turning up to them, is the physical layout. Because you see space for young people and there are adults there and parents, but also toddlers and younger children. And I think one thing that we tend not to talk about is the intergenerational relationships within young people. So like older young people looking after younger young people. And that's one thing that I think we see in a lot of work with young people um, across things, not just in environmentalism, but at the climate strikes, you'll, for instance, 
you'll have teenagers organizing it, for instance, you might have teenagers organizing it, and they will be thinking of toddlers and younger children and planning for toddlers and younger children. And I think those, those are very interesting relationships from a, from a kind of a, a perspective of examining them and learning from them. Anyhow, so the, I mean, the, gave way to an academic point of interest there about the technicalities of direct action. Um, returning to Brianna Fring, which is where we started uh, this activist from Samoa. I think for our toolkit, I think we need to pose each other some questions. And I think one of the questions needs to be, uh, what are young people doing that we can learn from? Um, I think uh, I've, I've tried to kind of uh, weave my way through some of the things that I think young people are doing. Um, but also just point out that they're doing some really remarkable things uh, that we can build on and include and, and hopefully work with. And then this question of what is real education um, and, and what are these things, uh, if young people are digging a well, what is, what is the water that they're trying to find? Do you know what I mean? And what kind of things can we do to support them in doing it? And, the, and I'm gonna finish because I, I like to finish on a practical positive note. Um, here are some things that I think we could put in our toolkit. So number one, uh, some ideas for direct action, uh, ways that young people can act out the world that they want to see. So what, if they want something, um, it's probably not in our place. It's not our place really to say, this is the world you should get. But I think it would be, it would be good for us to support young people who are exploring that process of digging the well and, and to hand them the tools if we've got them. So ideas for direct action. Um, I think we need to explore this question of the history we don't get uh, and, and, and about sustaining the old world. And I think uh, this kind of justice framing could be really helpful for our toolkit. And then uh, third, I guess, I just wanted to say, um, we, we should be looking at this kind of mishmash and remix and opportunities to remix ideas and build them uh, through co-authorship. Um, and youth co-authorship in particular is something that I think would really help out for us. Um, I know that's an extremely broad uh, point of action, but, uh, but it's my suggestion that, that youth co-authorship of methods can, can be really powerful. And that's what I've got for you. So, um, so I'm looking forward to discussing it. Uh, you can write your questions in the chat because uh, I can see them on my screen. Um, Jennifer, I don't know if you want to facilitate the chat um, uh, because then people can talk to each other and bounce off each other. Finally, uh, if you feel like you want to contact me um, outside of this discussion, uh, maybe later or, or whenever, you can email me or, or tweet me. Um, either of those things are fine. Okay. Thank you, Ben. Yeah, and, and I'll, I can help you uh, facilitate, I know. Sometimes we've got hands up and we've got... Um, questions okay. down in the chat. So um, well, let's start with Ellen because I see we have a hand up, Ellen Field. Hi, Ben. Thanks a lot for that awesome presentation. Um, my name is Ellen Field and I'm an assistant professor in the Faculty of Education at Lakehead. And I was wondering your sort of comments around, I've noticed um, here in Canada, we have in several provinces now, youth groups advocating ministries of education for it's sort of like where the climate strike movement has now sort of matured. So they're getting together and they're advocating for curriculum reform. Um, so they've sort of mapped out where climate change exists and now they're asking for a more comprehensive education. And I know in the UK as well, the organization Teach for the Future has been amazing in terms of their sort of advocacy and the panel of youth that I attended a webinar and heard them speak just blew me away with their conception of justice, their intersectionality and the ways that they were advocating for educational reform. So um, I'm curious and in recommendations that from my research I've put forward, we did request that uh, ministries consider youth consultation in the reforms nothing's happened. Um, but I do, I am curious around that piece of, you know, asking for youth to do some of that work and whether, like we, whether that's really fair in some ways, um, recognizing that they are youth. And so that piece on the consultation and, you know, we don't want to download responsibility 
when ministry should be leading in this way. So sort of how, if you know of any examples of where this is working well or models, I would love to be able to advocate <laughs> effectively. Thank you. Um, I, when I think of co-authorship personally, um, the person who springs around is Michelle Fine, who's at SUNY in New York, uh, and her work um, uh, with others uh, on, um, on uh, action research and young, uh, YPAR, Young Participatory Action Research, um, partly because that's what I have been trying to build studies around, and I've got a, a YPAR. A project coming out so it's like a field that I'm working in um, so I, I'm not saying it's the only one or the best one but it's the one I'm like working in right now um, but uh, I think I personally really like the way that um, that participatory action research can frame um, those kind of things not just as a consultation but as a like um, as a supported process of like you know like let's be practical, you know, like if I'm working in, in my town with young people, I do have some skills to share. Like I've got the privilege of having gone to university far too long and I, and I know how to do research. So it, it's not, it wouldn't be bad of me to go and work in a school and say, um, do you know what? If you want to change the, uh, the pollution on this road outside, here are some ways to gather data on it. Here are some ways to make sure that you present that way to, uh, to people who can make a change. And here's some support that I can give you. So I'm um, training young people to participate in deliberative uh, places, but also reaching out to those and saying, you know, you need to change the way that you're running this session if you want young people to talk to you. I, I kind of hear also in your, in your question that there's a distrust of, um, of political authorities or of, of power holders and power brokers and adults to like pay attention. And, I, and that's really frustrating too. Um, and I, I, I don't have a solution for that other than to keep working, I think. Um, and also to, up, to uphold and recognize that young people are frustrated by that and, and witness it and know it. And that one thing that really winds me up personally is when people see young people disappointed and frustrated and they say, well, you know, you're just not engaged. Well, no, actually, uh, you got to, if you're disengaged from politics in the UK right now, it's because you've got a fair appraisal of the system. Nobody's listening to you and they don't care. They're going to do what they want to do anyway. So to be disengaged and, and disaffected and distrustful is, is actually a, a pretty good um, marker. You don't want to be well adjusted to a badly adjusted system. So. So yeah, I think that frustration can be can be useful. I don't know if that helps. I mean, I I'm, curriculum reform is not is not like my specialty. I'd love to to learn more about your work, but um, but yeah, there's some amazing work being done. Um, oh, do you know the other thing your question made me think of was this: the way the sunrise movement in the U.S. will occupy buildings and sing in them. Which I mean, I know that that is just like a little snippet of an action, but like that's quite powerful to be able to occupy a building and then just like claim it with your voice and the way that they'll sing in them. And those kind of tactics can be extremely powerful. Um, yeah, can be extremely powerful. So uh, yeah, I don't know if we have a geographer who's done any um, like, um, what do they call it? Anyway, sorry, environmental audit quite often helps with young people too. Sorry, I'm rambling now. I'm on Christmas holiday mode. Thank you, sorry. Hi, um, I wanna jump in on that too. Um, I'm Cora, I'm a recent college grad. I'm working on a project with my ex-professor right now about pedagogy and climate change. Um, but I just wanted to add to your point that I think there's this unique position professors hold where with students, the turnover is so fast. And I think there's like a lot of institutional memory that gets lost in that. And so with activism, I think sometimes people come in and are like, I'm going to reinvent the wheel because they don't know that there's maybe already been student efforts or that there's certain people that are have played key roles. And I think professors can hold a really important role in like directing them that way and saying like, oh, these people actually did this or this person, someone you can put pressure on. <laughs> Sorry, my dog's barking. Um, <laughs> in that same way, I think that that's something I've appreciated so much in general is like, the ways professors can give me histories that I might not know about, um, whether that's in the institution or of social movements or of like what it would mean to have a student union. Um, so I think those are all important. 
Thank you. Yeah. Um, the, I'm thinking of work with uh, postgraduate committees and, uh, um, and postgraduate representation and, and what you say really um, speaks to me and my experience. Thank you. Uh, Andrew Bryant had his hand up. Hi. Um, thanks, Ben, for his presentation. Um, I have, I don't want to, this, this might seem kind of negative after all this positivity, but it's curiosity within student or within student or youth led groups, there's power, power dynamics that exist separate from adult power dynamics. And I'm curious if you encountered any situations where some students had difficulty um, taking action or getting, having a role in groups because of issues that were happening within the group. And I just ask this because I've spoken with some, some I'm a social worker in Seattle, by the way, I forgot to introduce myself, um, but I've worked with some students who have expressed, told me stories about in-group difficulties that they encountered and having difficulty expressing themselves or being heard. So just kind of curious if that came up at all. Yeah, thank you. Um, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of problems that young activists face that 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 question speaks to me too. Uh, one of them is that is this definition of an activist and the very definition of politics. I mean, the word politics falls like a sledgehammer on any conversation. Um, but the the idea of being an activist is one that that doesn't speak to most young people. And Emily Rainsford is somebody here at working here in the UK who writes about that. Um, uh, she did a lot of work with what you would call really traditional um, politically engaged young people, members of youth councils and political parties and things, who so often told her, we're not political, it's just our opinion, I'm not an activist. Uh, or uh, activists that I've worked with who, um, who shun the term um, for many reasons, one of which is that it, it kind of codes, it, it, does, it comes across as a very shiny uh, um, elitist term. Uh, and, it, and it doesn't speak to young people about what they're doing. Um, there's, there's a very complex um, kind of um, internal um, uh, a difficulty uh, in environmentalism and in young environmentalism um, uh, that I think Kerno and Helferty write really well about that contradiction in solidarity uh, where they talk about uh, and where young people will experience that kind of like Well, uh, there was a paper published recently by James Sloan in Sustainable Earth about young, uh, young environmentalism in London. And in his uh, study, what he's talking about is how many young people he met and talked to and interviewed who uh, basically said, well, I'm not interested in the environment. All I'm interested is in the issues that affect me in my neighborhood. And those are air pollution. Uh, those are um, uh, water pollution, access to green space. Uh, the flight path of the airport comes right over my neighborhood. And you know that these, these are then kind of uh, pushed out. I mean, they are environmental. And young people sometimes say they're not environmental or I'm not an activist. Then it's partly, I think, because environmentalism pushes them out and has always done so and said those aren't environmental issues. Those space issues or they're uh, issues of uh, racial inequality in your neighborhood and they're not green issues. And so, um, so when you talk, when you're talking, I'm thinking uh, within young groups, you also see that that problem that that you have to that they have to navigate and can be difficult to navigate. Um, yeah, I mean, I mean it, any group of people can be can be difficult, I suppose. But environmentalism itself has these contradictions in it, and a lot of them are racialized and and classed um, and gendered, and so and so they're they're really enduring. Um, and people are harmed by them in many ways. Um, yeah, I don't know. Well, I mean, it, your question was what to do about them, wasn't it? Well, um, it was, um, I guess I was just curious if that had been, if anybody who, anybody in your, you know, anybody expressed difficulties in having their voices heard within the group because of some people dominating groups, some people dominating the leadership, of the group within a student-led or, or youth-led organization. 
Yeah. I um the there uh one of the things that tends to happen with horizontalist movements is friendly fire sexism in my uh, my kind of experience and in my reading. And um yeah, I can think of one of the thing on the top of my head is a paper by Jeanne Martinez Palacios about the 15M movement in Spain, where they had a, a really open uh, horizontalist decision making body um, where anybody could talk, and so it was men talking. Um, because, you know, all you had to do was open your mouth. Well, in that case, it's men that talk. And the women were waiting until, you know, they had a space or they felt like they had something to share because sexism. And the men didn't wait until they had a proper answer. They just, you know, they just shared it because they came to mind. Um, so uh, so in any group, you know, you get that a bit. I, I don't know, That's that kind of like organizing structure is something that I would have to learn from others, I think. Um, yeah. And it looks like Thank Laura you. And, and Alan have uh, both dropped a, a couple of resources in the chat that specifically address that. So those could be really helpful for checking out. So we have five minutes left. Um, any other questions or thoughts or comments? I like thoughts and comments. I don't need a question. Yeah. I really like people's comments. Oh, but I have a question. Can I jump in? <laughs> Please do. Please do. Yeah, so I'm Doreen Stabinski, and I uh, I teach um, at the College of the Atlantic in Bar Harbor, Maine. Mm -hmm. And um, my question is, I teach a course called Climate Justice, among other courses. Um, and I was struck by the, the idea of history. Like what? It's interesting. It's an interesting, yeah. I would love to include more history. And so what, what history is missing? What do students feel like they don't get in school? And, and I think about colonial history, I think in the United States, history of, of dispossession and settler colonialism, um, I, you know, that sort of history. I guess I would think about history of, of social movements. I don't know, am, am I, is, but it would be great to, and I should probably just ask my students as well, but um, if you have any thoughts there. Um, this makes me think of a chapter I read written by Jen Garvey, who's an activist in Canada, a young activist and, and scholar, I think. Um, and, in, and in her work, she's writing about um, climate justice Montreal and about what that's been like, because she, uh, I think I'm representing her correctly as an indigenous activist who's been doing what would be called environmentalist work since Pontius was a pilot, you know, for a very long time. And um, and one of her reflections that I um, that I kind of reflect on in my work, uh, or I hope I do, um, is that she reflects on the experience of going to a climate strike, which is so large, so much larger than they've had before, uh, to be really excited and also to hear what is mostly a, a white group um, chanting whose future our future and that um, that those um, that those are really complicated and really difficult relationships to have um, I yeah I, I don't know what to do with it except to try and uphold it in its complexity and I think it's I think it's worth my personal opinion is that we have to keep hold of that complexity it is complex and we're stuck with it it's really difficult and that the only way I think we can deal with that complexity is to try and try and tease our way through it. Um, uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like I should be typing in the names of people that I reference in my answers, but uh, I, maybe I can do that after. To you, yeah. You're, yeah, it's it's difficult. Um, and I I wonder whether that's something that that really our toolkit needs to learn rather than offer tools for. Um, and if it's something that we need to learn, maybe our toolkit needs specific tools for, for how, to, um, how to listen. Yeah, I've um, just over the last week or so been, been listening to a um, couple of talks by Kyle Powis White, who's a Potawatomi. Um, and, you know, talking about climate justice and indigenous climate justice, and it's sort of fascinating. It's a, it's a, it's a completely different perspective, right? When, when your world was actually destroyed, and you were dispossessed, and your, you know, all of your, your connection with the earth was 
disrupted and and then you know now and from an indigenous perspective looking at white folks talking about what might happen to their planet when the planet of indigenous nations across the you know across north america were i mean they faced they faced that that dystopia they've been living in that dystopia for for 500 years and so a very very different point of view and very helpful and illuminating for me Thank you. Well, thank you for sharing that, Doreen. Um, so we're we're at time, um, and I know Ben has had an, an intense day, and one would never know that based on the, the 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 grace and the intelligence and the facility in which you shared your work. And so we're really really grateful for that. Um, and it was very, also very kind of you to share your contact information and to welcome people in this group to reach out to you from these conversations. One of the things that has been so encouraging and inspiring you, to me um, has been to see the kind of like connections and sort of side routes that um, folks have taken in sort of pairing up and sharing their work and then launching uh, new initiatives and projects and, and research partnerships. So. Um, you know, if, if you have any of those, please share them when we all log in together. Um, this does conclude our fall lineup. And so I'm going to be reaching out and sort of putting things together for the winter. Um, and I'm not in a big rush to do that. I think we can all just sort of take some time for the holidays to relax and get through grading and everything else, but to have something to come back to um, later this winter and, and get some other speakers. And in the meanwhile, um, just look for an email from me where I'll certainly follow up with um, the link to the existential toolkit once the first version is up. And of course, this is going to be a work in pro progress and we'll be adding to it and um, and, and making revisions as we go along. But I think we've already gathered so many incredible resources. I'm really excited for all of you to get to see your the fruition of your work uh, um, uh, featured on, on the website. So um, thank you all for, for logging in today and I'm wishing everybody a wonderful holiday season and I'm just expressing as much gratitude as I feel for everybody's energy and logging in and, and being part of these conversations in 2020. It's been really extraordinary. All right, thanks to all.